Hello out there, you are welcome to Day Tooth Academy, where we are devoted to building excellence in students, especially when it comes to the STEM subject. Our video today is going to be a walkthrough of the official marking scheme of the physics theory paper for the West African Senior School Certificate Examination for school candidates in the year 2020. But we are not just going to be limited to the scope of the marking scheme because what we notice is that looking at this particular exam, we have quite a lot of questions that students need to have in-depth understanding of beyond the way the marking scheme was just presented, just iterating how to mark and cope. We want to give you an in-depth look into the solution to these questions. We are going to be explaining the reason why the questions were actually interpreted the way they interpreted and then the best means to go about solving them. So we want you to just sit in and we'll have quite an interesting journey together. So generally you have your instructions but I just want to draw your attention to a number of things. Here, you have to answer 8 questions in all, 5 questions from part 1 and 3 questions from part 2. So don't go beyond that scope, okay? So write boldly, write legibly. Then notice this, you have to use 2B pencil to draw when necessary. So when you are drawing, make sure you use your pencil. Don't draw with biro. And then the general other stores, write your candidate number, fill in the questions that you answered and then the other information like this. In addition to writing your name on the front page of the booklet, also write your full name in the area provided on top of pages 3, 5, 9, 11, 13, and 15. Now, this is quite interesting. They are particularly telling you that on these pages, make sure that you write your candidate's name. If you don't take them to read this instruction set, you will not know this. I will just write and submit and believe that I have obeyed all the instructions, but that is not the case. So, just before starting your exam, okay, make sure you just go through these instructions to candidates that will help you to give the information that they are asking of you as appropriate. So yeah, we have this question paper and you can see again, they are reiterating that you need to answer five questions from part one and three questions from part two, making a total of eight questions in all. So these are the questions. You have your time as one hour, 30 minutes. I'm not going to be looking at this. I just want to show you the question, the way it was being asked. You can see that for this particular first section and even for the whole section you are being provided space that you need to write so that means when you are working don't waste your exam paper okay because right here you are going to give your answer even in your question booklet so you don't want to be making mistake that will not be a means in which you need to cancel and redo because space is not a friend for you so this is just a walkthrough of all the questions that are being asked that you are going to face for this particular year 2020 that can help you to prepare effectively for subsequent ones as you are going to feature it. Now, I have this question 11 in which is even looking exactly like an alternative to practical question. So, if you have not been familiar with this before, just keep on watching. You are going to have a very good feel of how to solve that question and even you construct the graph as is being shown here and you also determine the slope of the graph. Just stay tuned. Let's walk through this together and then we'll see how best you can solve it. And then, after all the questions, you can see this is now the marking scheme. This is the final marking scheme for the physics paper 2, particularly here. They are looking at the students in Gambia and the Nigeria, very applicable to students in the West African region generally. So these are the solutions. And like I said, these are not self-explanatory. So we are going to actually walk through how you are going to be solving these questions, giving explanation on the theoretical parts, giving you detailed solution on the calculation part, and then even getting to construct the graph just as is being asked in one of these questions we are going to construct this graph we are going to get the slope interpret the slope and do the work just as is being requested so let's just pitch in and go ahead to do our working together if you are here to subscribe to our channel these are the kind of videos that we are pushing in and we will solicit that you go ahead click that subscription icon then like the video for us to have a feel that yes these videos are barely relevant to you you are finding them useful and don't forget to help us to share this video. Just click on the share icon, share your social media spaces so that we can actually make this app available for as many students that are in need of it out there, okay? And then we can just go ahead and solve our questions together. So here in this question on Oak's law, we are told that an elastic material of length 3 meters is to be stretched to produce an extension three times its original length. We are to calculate the force required to produce the extension if the force constant of the material is 
982.3 newton per meter so what we have is just something like this let's say we have a material like this okay we are told that it is three meters but now we told that a force will be applied on this particular material a force f and this material is stretchy okay so it can stretch with the application of this force we are told that the new length of the material has not been extended and the extension is three times is originally this is where students you shouldn't make mistake initially let's just look at this particular place that this is his initial length three meters but now the extension that was produced from here to here as a reason of this force that is applied if you call it e we are told from the question that that extension is three times is original length three if l naught is the original length it is three times original length. so that extension is three times three meters and that is nine meters so we need the value of that extension but by reason of the formula from Hooke's law the force that produces an extension is in the material is given as a product of the force constant multiplied by the extension okay and in this particular case if you want to put in the values that force that we are asked to find will be the force constant 982.3 newton per meter okay then multiply by the extension what's the extension now it's not the three meters that we are giving originally it is three times its initial length so that is nine meters as we have calculated there so it is times nine meters now i want you to look at something and um, look at this value this value is per meter and this is meter outrightly those two units will cancel out when they are multiplying each other if you remember your law of indices you have m raised to power minus one multiplied by m raised to power one so of course this will be just a single m and you have minus one plus one which is m raised to power zero and any number raised to power zero it's one okay so that means that the formula you are even using is in line with what you expected to do so what we are going to have is 982.3 newtons multiplied by nine and to evaluate this you can just bring in a calculator you say we want to evaluate 982.3 multiplied by nine and that is what in decimal place 8840.7 so this is 8840.7 newtons and students i just want to emphasize this for you once you don't put your unit you are going to lose some marks so always remember to put your unit whenever you are working in any science related subject in short in any subject even if it's maths okay so the force that is going to produce the extension is going to be 8840.7 newtons in this question, we are being asked that in a solar panel for its supply, we are to state the function of each of the following parts. And we have the metal flat plate, the thermal insulator, and the tubes that can be found in a solar panel for its supply. So, we need to have a look at what this is actually looking at before we can be able to define what this particular part can be used for. And it is as shown on this diagram here. In this diagram, we can see the metal flat plate on top of the roof of the house. And what it does is that it collects the rays of light coming from the sun and it absorbs the heat, okay, which is actually the energy that is trapped to ensure there is a circulation in that particular water system, okay. So that is the function of the metal flat plate. For the thermal insulator, the thermal insulator will normally be inserted between the metal flat plate that is collecting the heat and absorbing that heat energy and the roofing material you know, normally the roofing material and the metal flat plate if they are coming in contact together there will be heat exchange by conduction but we want to reduce that so this thermal insulator here this particular region and i'm shading in red okay those ones are actually going to act as the insulator to minimize heat loss between the metal flat plate and the roofing of the house system where this system will be installed now the tubes are going to be conveying the heat that are absorbed and like in this case it's going to take it to the water container which we actually have like an heating element so so the tube will actually trap the heat energy and bring it to the particular container where it's going to generate it to boil the hot water and of course as that tube is conveying that there's another pipe that is taking you can see there's a pumping machine here is actually pumping the cold water 
up such that this energy that is captured can eat up that cold water and you pass it out. In this particular case, blue is the one taking the water to the system on the roof and red are yeah, the set of tools that are actually bring in the water back. So this is the overview of the system and that is how it works. So we've been able to identify what these three, what they work for and we can just summarize that as shown here that in the first case, the metal plate receives and absorbs solar radiation to produce heat and then the thermal insulator minimizes its loss as a reason of the interaction between the metal flat plate and the roofing material and then finally in C, the tubes help to circulate the heat. You can see it's the one bringing the heat into the container where the water will be boiled and then it will be circulated back and so this is actually the answer to this particular question. In this question on optics, we are told that in the design of an optical fiber, what type of material is most suitable for design of the core? And then we have to state one condition that is necessary to confine signals to the core of an optical fiber. Let's look at the pictorial view of what we are going to be talking about here. So, this is actually like a cross-section area of the optical fiber. And this is, this here is regarded as a core. And this, the sheet, is regarded as a cladding. Okay, that's a protective sheet that is covering the core. And the material that is mostly used for the core is actually glass. Also, time of plastic material, but mostly it is glass, okay? Because the rays of light that are actually coming into the core of the material needs to be restricted to the inside of the optical fiber itself. We don't want a case in which, like if you have rays of light coming into the material, say like this, you don't want it to diffuse into the cladding of the material, okay? You want it in such a way that this rays of light will be highly maintained inside that particular cladding. So, if this ray of light is coming like this and is bouncing off the edge of the core, you want it to still remain within the core and not diffusing into the cladding. And for that, then the refractive index of the glass should be higher than the refractive index of the cladding. Okay, so this angle that is coming in and this outer angle should not exceed the critical angle so that we will now have light rays diffusing into the cladding. So, the condition to confine signals to the core of the optical fiber is that the refractive index of the glass should be greater than that of the cladding. Now, we can just summarize as shown here that in the first case, it's glass or plastics that are most suitable material for the design of the core of an optical fiber. And then in the second case, to confine signal to the core of the optical fiber, the refractive index of the core must be greater than the refractive index of the cladding. This will allow us to actually restrict the signals inside the core. It will not diffuse into the cladding. And with that, the data transmission can be done for long distances because the signal strength will not be lost. Okay, So that is the principle of the operation of optical fiber. In this question, we are told that the velocity V of a wave in a stretched string depends on the tension T, which is in the spring, and the mass per unit length mu of the spring. So we are to obtain an expression for the velocity in terms of the tension and the mass per unit length. But this is the caveat. Look at this. We have to use the method of dimension. So how do we go about solving questions like this using the method of dimensions? Now we are going to be looking at that holistically in this question, just you stay tuned. So we have, let's say we have a particular string attached to, let's say, maybe some wall, okay? And then we're told that for this particular string, if this is a string, the velocity of a wave that will be experienced in that particular spring is going to depend on the tension T. So let's say there's a force that's being applied which is the tension in the spring, then the spring itself has some mass, okay, and it also has some length, it has some length L, okay. Now we are being told to obtain an expression for the velocity in terms of T and mu, and we are to use the method of dimensions. The method of dimensions means that we need to go back to the base unit of the SI unit in which we are going to be having the mass, which is denoted as M, okay, the length which is denoted as L and the time which is denoted as T, okay? So this we are going to be making use of to actually solve this question. But look at the question originally. What are we giving? We are told that the velocity depends on the tension 
and the mass per unit length. So if you want to write that just like we do in normal mathematics that we write variation, we can say V is proportional to the tension, let's say raised to some power, I'm coming to that, and then the mass per unit length also raised to some power. Now we are putting this as raised to some power because we don't know what the constant of proportionality will bring. So if we are actually to do that, we can now say V is equal to K multiplied by the tension raised to power A multiplied by the mass per unit length raised to power B. Now, our mandate in trying to solve this is to find the value of A and B in such a way that the constant of proportionality will have taken care of it. I will be able to find the expression for this velocity by using this method of dimensions. Now, we have some quantities that we are given in this particular equation. You can see we have velocity, we have tension, we have the mass per unit length. So we need to go down and drill on how we, are, we can actually make use of the method of dimension to break velocity, tension, and mass per unit length to their base units. Okay, so ideally we know that velocity is displacement over time. And displacement over time, we can just refer to as displacement is measured in length, so we have that is L. Time is measured in T, so we have that is T. So if you want to put that in the dimension, we have L, then T raised to power minus 1. We are putting T raised to power minus 1 because we are expressing this just in a linear form, in its indices. And when you have division in indices, it is the same as raised to power minus 1, okay? Then we have tension. Tension, by reason of its formula, is force per unit area. So we have force over area. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We need to also further break this down to its base units. So force itself, we know it is mass times acceleration, okay? So we still have the area as the base. But acceleration, we also know to be velocity over time. So we have m over a initially, okay? But acceleration, we know it to be what? The velocity over the time. But yet, we have not got to the base dimension because even velocity, we just got here to be LT minus 1. So we can further break this down to say we want to put the dimension since we already have V initially, like in this place, it is L over T. So we have mass, that is M. Area is length times length. That's why we have the unit as meter square. So that is L raised to power 2, okay? V itself is L over T. We have L over T. But we also have this other T. So that T will become 2. We have T raised to power 2. And then this L and this L can cut such that what we have eventually is here we have one L remaining. So we have M over L T raised to power 2. And that will be linearly M L raised to power minus 1 T raised to power minus 2. Again, the law of indices is coming into place here such that those in the denominator they will carry negative power. And T that is raised to power 2 will become T raised to power minus 2. So now we can also use the same method to find the dimension of the mass per unit length. By that definition, it is mass over length. Okay. So once it is mass over length, mass is M, length is L. So linearly, this is M, L minus 1. Now we have these three that we can actually use here. When we have K is constant, we are the one that introduced that. Okay. So we can say, instead of writing all of this equation now, we can put in the dimensional unit of each of these quantities. Like for velocity, we have it to be L T raised to power minus 1 is equal to K. Then T itself, the dimension is M L minus 1, T minus 2. But we have it raised to power A, okay? And then the move we have is M L minus 1 also raised to power b. So this is what we work with to actually equate the left hand side and the right hand side to find the value of a and b such that we will evaluate the expression for the velocity in this particular question. So I'm going to clear this right hand side but this is how we actually go to the base of those units and then we will solve that as appropriate. So if you want to continue working on that, on the left hand side we can see that we don't have m at all. And what is the implication of that? From our rules of indices, we know that any number raised to power 0 is 1. So, on the left-hand side, the power of m is 0, okay? That is why it's not reflecting here at all. So, we have L, then T raised to power minus 1 is equal to K. We will try to open this bracket. 
since A is acting on the whole of this entity, it will be that we have m raised to power a, l raised to power minus 1 times a will be minus a, t raised to power minus 2 times a will be minus 2a, okay? And the same we also do here for the mass per unit length of the spring. m raised to power b will be m raised to power b, and then l minus 1 raised to power b will be l minus b because we multiply this particular power with this outer power is also part of the loss of indices. So as physics students, you should actually have a very good grasp of the understanding of mathematics. So here now, again, we are going to use indices because we are having m and m. And from the law of indices, what we know is that we have m raised to power a multiplied by m raised to power b. We can say this is a single m and we add the power. So that is what we are going to employ now to try and open up this bracket and equate the left hand side and the right hand side okay so you can say here it will be m raised to power zero l t minus one is equal to k m here we have a and we have b so we can have a single m raised to power a plus b okay l we have minus a and minus b so if you add the two it will be minus a minus b then t is just a singular entity raised to power minus two a now looking at this and comparing the left hand side and the right hand side we can conclude that from here, since the bases are equal, then the powers, they will also be equal. So that we can have A plus B is equal to 0 as a function of the power on M, okay? And then as a function of the power on L, we can say that L is just one here, but L is minus A minus B here. So we can have minus A minus B is equal to 1, okay? And then for T, we can have minus 2a is equal to minus 1. So we have these three that we can actually attempt to solve by whatever means is appropriate to us so that we can get this. But looking at this third entry, I can say I want to divide by minus 2 so that this minus 2 will cut and this negative sign will also cut and I will find a to be 1 over 2. Okay, that is interesting. If a is 1 over 2, from here b is equal to minus a and therefore b will be minus 1 over 2. All right, okay. I think that is getting quite interesting. So if I want to go back to this equation that we coined out of the expression that was given in the question, I can say that means the velocity is equal to k multiplied by the tension. Now, what's the power of the tension? It is 1 over 2 multiplied by the mass per unit length having a power of minus 1 over 2. Again, again, well, you see, our understanding of math needs to be very, very sharp. If we have this, that means what we're having is that V is K multiplied by T. This negative sign on mu will mean that it is over mu and then raised to power 1 over 2. You can leave it as this, but even I know that 1 over 2 as a power means it is the square root. So, I can just outrightly express the solution like this. I want to erase this with my understanding of indices. I can now say that this means that V is equal to K multiplied by the square root of T over mu. Now, this negative is what affected mu to actually come to the denominator. And this power of 1 over 2 common to both is what is bringing in the square root. And just like this, we've been able to find an expression for the velocity in terms of the tension t and the mass per unit length mu as given for this question. The good thing about this type of questions is that you don't just get to know them by watching videos like this. You practice and the more you practice, the better you are going to become. All right. In this question, we are told that a satellite launched with velocity ve just escapes the Earth's gravitational attraction. Now, given that the radius of the heart is r, we are to show that that escape velocity is equal to the square root of 20 multiplied by the radius of the heart, given that the acceleration due to gravity g is 10 meters per second square. So, if you want to have a pictorial view of what we are talking about, it is just as shown here. And from the question already, you can look at the radius of the heart from the center of the heart to the point where the satellite is escaping the heart gravitational pull. And we can take that as radius r. Okay. Now, we are told that there is an escape velocity 
with which the satellite just escapes the Earth's gravitational attraction. There are basically two ways we can go about to evaluate the formula for the escape velocity. We can use the gravitational force, but here I want to use the conservation of energy. That originally we know that the kinetic energy with which the satellite is launched is going to be equal to the potential energy at the height where the satellite had already reached to escape the Earth's gravitational attraction. Okay, so you can actually attempt that other method by making use of the gravitational force. Okay, but here this is what I want to use. And what do we notice now? There is an escape velocity ve in which this satellite of mass m is actually going at already we have the radius i but the height that the satellite is escaping with will actually be the radius of the earth to the point where it escaped from the attraction pool of the earth okay so if you want to just put in the formula for this particular equation the kinetic energy is half multiplied by mv square okay the potential energy is the mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the height. But now that height is the radius of the earth that we are looking at. So with all of this that we have, we can just say that this mass is going to cancel this mass, okay? So that um, V square over 2 is equal to acceleration due to gravity multiplied by R. And if you cross multiply, we can see that V square is going to give us 2 multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity g multiplied by the radius of the earth g already we have been given as 10 meters per second so if you multiply that that will be 20 r such that this is what we are asked to find such that we can see v is equal to the square root of 20 r so this is a very very simple means by which you can just evaluate this and we'll get our full marks but if you want to make use of the gravitational equation you can also use that and you will also see that you are going to arrive at the same answer. All right. In this question, we are told that a bullet is fired from a gun at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The bullet remains in flight for 25 seconds before touching the ground. We have to calculate the velocity of projection given that acceleration due to gravity g is 10 meters per second squared. So we can look at a pictorial view of what we have as a case scenario here and I just want to give some little explanation so that students will be able to just do this on the fly. We are going to be use, making use of the equation of motion V is equal to U plus 80. But now, looking at this particular diagram, there are a number of things that we can notice. Okay, Now, this can be taken as the maximum height H maximum. Then from here to here, so from here to here, that is the distance covered the bullet in this case generally referred to as a projectile so that is the range but there's something we need to note in this particular case the bullet is being fired at an angle to the horizontal it's going to have two components the initial velocity we have a vertical component okay vy it will also have an horizontal component vx okay so these are the things that we can actually make use of to tweak the general equation of motion that we know so that we can see how we apply it in this particular case of the projectile. So I want to just start by looking at the maximum height. At that maximum height, we are noticing that the final velocity V will be zero at the maximum height. The initial velocity, because it's not a component along the horizontal, it will only be a component along the vertical. So that initial velocity, that will now be V sine the angle that we are giving, which in this case is 30, okay, this 30 but it is the vertical component which is vy that is v sine 30. now for the acceleration due to gravity because the bullet is fired and moving in a direction opposing the pull of acceleration due to gravity this will be minus g okay and t is the time taken to reach the maximum height okay this is time so if you just look at this you will see that what we have is zero is equal to v sine theta minus gt okay so that if you rearrange you will see that the time taken to reach the maximum height is going to be v sine theta over g we should be able to do this since we are science students this is actually a very simple thing but now the total time taken for this particular projectile motion will be two times this particular set of time that we are having so that we can derive the equation that t is equal to 
2v sine theta over g and this is actually how they derive the formula for the total time of flight for this particular equation now look at the information that we have we have the angle theta to be 30 okay we are looking for the velocity of projection which is v okay we have the acceleration due to gravity which is g giving us 10 meter per second and we have the time t as 25 seconds so we can easily use this formula this is very good for us to actually solve this particular question and that is what we are going to do right now so we have the formula that we derive to be the total time of flight to be 2v sine theta over g now from the question we'll be giving t to be 25 seconds okay i've we'll been giving theta to be 30 degrees and we have g that was given to be 10 meters per second square so we can put all of this into this equation to say therefore we are going to have t is 25 is equal to 2v v is what we are looking for sine 30 divided by 10 so we can have 2 here 1 2 here is 5 when we cross multiply we are just going to have this to be v sine 30 is equal to 25 times 5 that is 125 so you can divide both sides by sine 30 so over sine 30 sine 30 itself is 0 0.5 so here you can see that we are just going to have this cutting out okay and then we have our v to be 125 divided by 0 0.5 okay 125 over 0 0.5 is as if you are just having 125 divided by 1 over 2 so that two will still multiply it back so that we have 125 times 2 okay so this is going to be nothing but 250 let me just show you from the calculator i have 125 divided by sine 30 and close the bracket so this is 250 so it's like if you are multiplying 125 by 2 so this is 250 meter per second so that is the velocity with which the bullet is fired from the gun inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal with this you've been able to actually get your question correctly the trick is to resolve the velocity to the vertical component and the horizontal component and you just put that in the equation of motion and you'll get your answer out all right in this question we have to state three properties of lasers that make them preferable to using ordinary light beam so there are some special occasions in which people will prefer to use lasers instead of just using any ordinary light beam and a pictorial view will show us some of those properties now now lasers are the kind of the light that snipers and the soldiers they use they mount on their rifles on their guns automatic guns or whatever it may be so that they can actually trace the target that they want to focus on and you can see if that's what they are trying to use they cannot be using the normal light like the one coming from your torchlight that will give wide range of light emanating and um, expanding as it leaves the light source just as being shown in this particular case for those particular lasers they need it to focus on a single entity so it should be monochromatic if it is a visible laser light it should just be monochromatic you don't want it to diffuse and go up and down like this it should just be monochromatic it should also be coherent these are differences between it and the normal light which is non-coherent then it should be directional it should just have a single point of focus where it's directed to and it will aim at that and because it has high intensity you can actually be focused it's not going to lose its power unlike the ordinary light beam if you put on the torch light you notice that from the source of the torch it will be very bright very light but if you go to a far distance and you want to see something very far that will not be feasible in the case of a normal light so these are some of the properties that makes lasers more preferable if you want to put it down you can see it travels very long distance without losing its intensity and it gives more intense power it has narrow optical bandwidth it can be emitted continuously and it is monochromatic stating any three of these you are going to get your full marks as requested yeah in this question we are told to define a torque and to state three factors that determine a torque so if you want to look at that solution like you know i normally advocate a picture is worth a thousand words and here you can see a picture that we are looking at and we can see in this picture here this is a spanner okay so imagine you are making use of a spanner to actually turn a particular boat just as being shown here now for you to do that to bring in a spanner into the boat but just putting the spanner on the boat is not going to affect anything 
you need to apply a force f that is as shown here and that force that you are going to apply you will see that it's going to run perpendicular these are very key important concepts when you are talking about torque or moment about a pivot point about an axis so it's the application of the force in this particular direction that we ensure that the boat is either being loosened up or being tightened as the case may be okay so if you want to define a torque it's just as shown here that the torque is the turning effect of a force about a pivot or an axis and looking at this example that we have here you can see now the force that is being applied is this particular f okay the pivot or the axis where it's being applied is also shown here and we have some distance okay between that point of application of force and the axis that we are looking at that is the distance r and the force that is being applied is force f so the factors are determining a torque include the magnitude of the applied force f here so how big a force or how small a force is being applied and then the direction of the applied force here you can see that this particular direction is a clockwise motion okay so it's moving just like the same way your work clock will be moving okay so it is a clockwise movement and then the perpendicular distance of the force from the pivot you can see this is a force and this distance denoted as r from the point of application of the force here to the axis which is the location of the boat this particular length is the perpendicular distance of the force from the pivot notice something it is the perpendicular distance okay so it's not as if the force should be in this particular direction if that is the case then this is just a linear force it's not a torque or if you're having it being applied in the opposite direction here that is also not a torque that's just a linear force in this particular case need to be applied perpendicular to the pivot on which it is being applied okay so that is just all there is to answer this question on torque in this question we're asked to define free fall and to define free fall just imagine the popular story about the scientist that was looking at an apple fall down from the tree and because of that he got to deduce the gravitational law so free fall is the vertical motion of a body under the influence of gravitational force or its own weight so that's why there's that popular proverb in yoruba language that any object that goes up will definitely come down okay so here you can see even apple that is falling from the tree will definitely come down why is as a reason of the influence of the gravitational force and even his own weight in which is being exerted and pulled towards the center of the heart so that is the definition of free fall so in this second question we're told that a body is thrown vertically upwards from the top of a tower 40 meters high with a velocity of 10 meters per second we're to calculate the time taken for the body to reach the ground now i want to bring in a pictorial view for us to really understand what is happening with respect to this body that's being thrown vertically upwards from the top of a tower which is 40 meters high so let's take this as the 40 meters tower so the body which is denoted in red here is being thrown vertically upwards so we have two set of motion that the body is going to undergo first the upward motion and then the downward pull as a reason of gravitational force so in the upward moment the initial velocity was given to be 10 meters per second so that was the velocity with which the body was thrown upwards then at the point that it got to its maximum height the velocity at that particular point is going to be zero so if the initial velocity is 10 meters per second at the maximum height the final velocity is going to be zero because at that point it's not moving upward again but it will momentarily come to a, to a rest before it now starts to come down then for that downward motion that initial velocity is now zero and then it will have a final velocity but it is coming down as a result of the gravitational force that is pulling it downwards so in the initial case when it's being thrown upwards from the 40 meter tower it will also travel an additional distance d upwards so that when it's coming down the total distance it needs to traverse will be the height of the tower which is 40 meters plus the distance that it has traversed from the top of the tower where it was being thrown so that is why we have 40 plus d now the mandate for us is to calculate the time taken for the body to reach the ground that time will be first the time it took to reach the maximum height and then the time it used to come down to the ground level from that maximum height so let's look at how we can get those two times we have the time going up and the time coming down using the equations of motion here we have the initial velocity as 10 meters per second and the final velocity as zero meter per seconds we don't know the distance but we are concerned 
about the time. So if you have to look at the equation V is equal to U plus AT, okay? Now, we know that our V for the upward motion, in the upward motion, okay, the V is zero, zero meter per seconds. The U is what is 10 meter per seconds. And then we can use the A, which is the acceleration due to gravity that is going to be pulling the body down so that it will be reducing its velocity as it's traveling up. So that is opposing the direction of motion. So it's going to be negative. So minus 10 meter per second square. And then T, we can find as a T in moving up. So if we substitute all of this into this equation, we are going to have that we have, let me use ink, we have 0 is equal to 10 minus 10 T, okay? Such that T here will be 10 over 10, and that is equal to 1 second. So the time for it to go up to reach its maximum height is 1 second. Now, for the downward motion, for the downward motion, let's see what we can use. Here, we have the initial velocity to be 0 meter per second. We are not actually concerned about the final velocity. We have the acceleration due to gravity acting on the body. And we have the distance to be 40 plus d. Okay. So, if you want to say we want to make use of s is equal to ut plus half a t square. Since we are looking for t, the u is 0. So, this can easily knock out. But we need to find the s. The s is going to be 40 plus d. But we need to get the value of d. So, if you want to take that value of d, we can say initially from the upward motion, from v square is equal to u square plus 2 as for the up. Here, we can see that our v is 0 is equal to the u square, that is 10 raised to the power 2, plus... Now, since it is going in the negative direction, it has to be minus, minus 2 times 10 multiplied by s. Our s in this particular case now is d. That is for the upward motion, okay? So from here, if we are to solve, we can see that 20d is going to be 100 because if we move this to the left-hand side, it will be 20d is equal to 10 raised to the power 2 is 100. So that d is equal to 100 over 20 and that is going to be 5 meters, okay? So for this particular s, we can say we have our s here to be 40 plus d will be 40 plus 5 and that is 45 meters okay already a is the acceleration due to gravity that is acting on the body and t is what we are looking for so we can just employ that to say therefore s which is 45 is equal to half multiplied by g which is 10 then multiplied by t raised to power 2 2 can go here 1 2 in 10 is 5 so that we can have t square is equal to here yeah, we're going to have as 45 over 5 that is 9 then t in coming down is equal to the square root of 9 and that is 30 seconds but what we're asked to find is the total time it's going to take for the body to reach the ground that total time t total is going to be the time it took to go up which is one second plus the time it took to reach the ground which is 3 and that will be nothing plus four seconds so this is the total time it will take for the body to reach the ground as appropriate in this beautiful question we are told that a cube of wood of side 8 cm floats at the interface between oil and water with 2 cm of its lower surface below the interface as shown in the diagram below so here is the diagram here is the wood in black and here is water it is 2 cm submerged in water while 6 cm of it is in the oil but we need to remember that it is a cube is a cube okay now, given that the relative densities of oil and water are 0.72 and 1.00 respectively, we are to calculate the mass of the wood. Now, I want to reiterate this. We are told that it is a cube of wood that we are looking at. So, this diagram is actually not two-dimensional. It is three-dimensional, just as I'm going to show now. So, this is the true picture of what this diagram should originally look like. It is a three-dimensional thing in which, yeah, for the cube of wood this is eight centimeters okay and this particular base is also eight centimeters but I want us to note something we are told that it has two centimeters of its lower surface below the interface so here from here 
to here. This is what? 2 cm, just as it's being denoted here. Why the other one that is not shaded? This will be 6 cm. Okay? So, the 2 cm is the one in water. So, that's why I just differentiated with this yellow like color. So, this 2 cm is on water. And the one that is not shaded at all is in oil. So, we need to get that because not getting that, we're going to miss this question outrightly. So, the mandate is that we are to get the mass of the wood. Originally, we know that density is mass over volume such that the mass in this particular case the mass of the wood will be the density multiplied by the volume okay and now we are told that the relative densities of oil is 0.72 and that of water is one that's why we are saying respectively but now for the mass of the wood we need to consider the uptrust in water and the uptrust in oil but again look at the unit we are giving we are giving all our unit in centimeters we need to convert them to meters before we'll be able to work with the volume of the wood so that we can get the mass of the wood so we just want to do that we can say for eight centimeters that will be eight over 100 meters and that will be 0 0.08 meters then for the other ones we have two centimeters will also be 0 0.02 meters and 6 centimeters will be 0 0.06 meters so having this will help us to use the right unit in calculating the volume and eventually getting the mass for this particular cube of wood but this is what i want us to get the mass of the wood is going to be the density of the wood multiplied by the volume of the wood but because we're having two case scenarios there that will be the density in water multiplied by the volume in water plus the density in oil multiplied by the volume in oil so this is the two case scenarios that will generate the total mass of the wood for us in this particular situation so if you want to just calculate that we can say the mass of the wood is now going to give us now the density in water we have been told that it is relatively one so we have one multiplied by the volume in water so what is the volume in water here we have 8 centimeters by 8 centimeters by 2 centimeters. That is the region that is submerged in water. But we cannot use centimeters because we need to use the standard SI unit. So we need to use meters. That will be 0 0.08 meters times 0 0.08 meters multiplied by 0 0.02. So we have 0 0.08 times 0 0.08 multiplied by 0 0.02. Okay. Then plus the density and multiplied by the volume in oil. The relative density in oil we have been given to be 0.72, so we have 0.72, okay, times the volume in oil will now need to be 8 centimeters by 8 centimeters by 6 centimeters. But again, we are working with the SI unit, so we need to convert them to meters. That will be 0.08 times 0.08 times 0.06. So this is the correct way to go about trying to solve this so if you want to just use a calculator to evaluate this so we have in the first case 1 times 0 0.08 times 0 0.08 times for the one in water it is times 0 0.02 okay so that's what that is 1.28 exponent minus 4 1.28 times 10 raised to the power minus 4 plus the mass in oil that will be 0 0.72 times 0 0.08 times 0 0.08 times 0 0.06 so what's that that is 2.7648 exponent minus 4 2.7648 exponent minus 4 and if we add the two together 1.28 exponent minus 4 plus the answer that we just got okay so that is going to be 4.0448 4.0448 times 10 raised to the power minus 4 kilogram all right so this is going to be the mass of the wood as we are expected to calculate and we're able to get this because 
we understand that first we are working in a three-dimensional space because of the information that we are given that is a cube it is a cube of wood that we are working with then we are able to actually use the formula that mass will be density times volume and then our volume we are calculating in the standard is a unit of meters and not centimeters and doing that we are able to evaluate the mass of the wood as appropriate. In this question we are asked to explain resonance frequency as applied in RLC series circuit. So let's look at our diagram of how RLC series circuit look like. So this is a typical scenario of an RLC series circuit and that is meaning that it has a resistor okay and then a capacitor and an inductor now across the circuit we are going to be having a voltage operating at a certain frequency which is being used to generate a current and that current will be the ratio of the voltage to the total impedance in the circuit in a normal simple circuit we use the voltage over the resistance but here we need to factor in the capacitor and the inductor so that we have what we call an impedance the impedance which is here will now be the combination of the resistance and the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance just as is shown in this particular equation furthermore we can get the capacitive reactance of the circuit as 1 over wc where c is the capacitance of the capacitor okay and then we can get the inductive reactance as wl where l is the inductance of the circuit and then w itself we can get as 2 pi the frequency of generation of the voltage across the circuit so this is a typical scenario of a rlc circuit but now we are talking about resonant frequency what happens in resonant frequency what happens in that particular case is that the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance they are equal such that the impedance is now going to only be the value of the resistance across the circuit because from here you can see z will now be the square root of r square and that will be just r so that is the case in which you have the resonant frequency in an rsc circuit so what that means is that number one the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance they are equal okay so they are not going to have any effects on the circuit and then the total impedance z will be the resistance of that particular circuit that's also going to affect the phase the angle because here since sl and sc they are equal so you have it to be actan 0 over r and actan 0 over r is actan 0 which means that the phase the angle between the resistance and the impedance is going to be zero so like we said here the z will not be equal to r because this angle would have been nullified okay so that is a scenario of the resonant frequency as applied in RLC series circuit and we can just define it like this that the resonant frequency is the frequency of oscillation when the capacitive reactance this capacitive reactance is equal to the inductive reactance this okay and at such occurrence the impedance which is z is equal to the resistance such that the current is maximum while the impedance is minimum so the impedance will be minimum and here this impedance will be minimum and the current definitely will have its highest value so that's the explanation of resonant frequency as applied in RSC series circuits. Continuing with that question, we are told to sketch a diagram to illustrate the variation of frequency f with the resistance r, the capacitive reactance ze, and the inductive reactance zv in RSC series circuits. And then we are to use the diagram that we draw to state whether the current in the circuit leads, lags, or is in phase with the supply voltage when the frequency is equal to the resonant frequency the frequency is less than the resonant frequency and then the frequency is greater than the resonant frequency you can see we're told f now is the resonant frequency so first looking at the diagram is going to look just like this and i want to just explain this particular concept if you recollect from your understanding of mathematics when you have an inverse function like here the capacitive reactance is one over 2 pi fc because of this c 2 pi left 2 pi left you can see that those are constants in both the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance but because the capacitance is an inverse function that's why this curve is looking like this like this curve okay and it is at its highest when you are starting out and then to gradually reduce just as shown 
but for the inductive reactance look at this it's just a linear equation so it's going to be a straight line graph passing through the origin you can see like when you are saying y is equal to ms plus c the c here is actually not existing so that means the intercept is zero it is passing through the origin so you understand how mathematics can really help you but i'll still further explain some things that you need to note now the resistance is going to be a constant it's not changing in value because we are not using a real stat it's just a resistance now we are having the graph of the reactance against the frequency but if you notice on this left hand side this is the resonant frequency where the value of the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance they will knock out each other okay here at this particular place so at that point it's only the hard that will be the value in concentration but on this left hand side you can notice something for this particular green you can see that here the capacitive reactance in red is greater than the inductive reactance on the left hand side whereas on the right hand side the inductive reactance xl is greater than the capacitive reactance so this will help us to actually answer the second question so if you have your graph like this i want to look at the second question i will just want to show you some things there just as it is here you can see now this is actually the explanation if i want to denote correctly of this question this is the answer to a2 this is a2 here and here this is a3 but if you recollect we are saying that the phase the angular phase is equal to actan the difference in xl and xc over the r okay that is actually the value for the phase now look at this in this particular left region to the resonant frequency i told us that the xc is greater than the xl so in this particular case that means for f less than f no you are going to have the angle to be acting a negative number because here since xc is greater than xl then it will be a negative number and if you take your calculator just look at this after let's say just minus one for example that's going to be minus 45 that means that angle is also negative the angle is negative means that it is lagging so when f is less than f naught you can see like here in beta when f is less than f naught then the current is going to lag the supply voltage and interestingly when like the gamma question when f is greater than f naught what you will notice is that for that particular case let me just let me just show you here when f is greater than f naught then your turn is going to be acting positive because in that case xl will be greater than xc is going to be this particular side it is f no f f here greater than the resonant frequency then for that particular region xl is greater than xc so this particular expression in brackets is going to be positive then your theta is positive meaning that current is going to lead the supply voltage but in the first case the alpha case when your f is equal to the resonant frequency the current is in phase with voltage because the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are going to knock out each other so that we only have the resistance and like i explained before in that particular case i will just be v over r and that will just be in phase so this is the correct solution to this particular question you will do well to note the application of your mathematical reasoning so that you can apply in questions like this in subsequent times all right In this question, we're asked to define mutual inductance. So, this is the pictorial view of what we have whenever we are going to have mutual inductance. And what is happening is that, as a reason of the current that is changing in this particular coil, this first coil, we are going to have a magnetic field being induced. This magnetic field B being induced in the second coil in such a way that is going to produce an induced EMF that will be observed in the coil. So, if you want to define, we can just say. Mutual inductance is the ratio of the inducing EMF in one coil or circuit here to the time rate of change of current that is producing it. Or we can say it is the production of EMF in a circuit in this circuit as a result of the change in the magnetic flux or the circuit in an adjacent circuit linked to it as shown in this particular picture. So EMF is being induced in this coil 2 as a result of the changing current in this coil 1 and that is mutual inductance.
In this question, we are told that the coil of an electric generator has 500 tons and 8 centimeters diameter. If it rotates in a magnetic field of intensity 0.25 Tesla, we are to calculate the angular speed when its peak voltage is 480 volts, then pi will be given to be 3.142. So let's list the parameters that we are given in this particular question. Starting from N was given to be 500, all right. We have the diameter is 8 centimeters, but we need to use the standard unit, so that should be 8 over 100 meters, and 8 over 100 meters is 0 0.08 meters, but that is the diameter, okay? We What we need is actually the area of that particular coil, and since it is a circular coil, the area is pi r square, so that will be the pi we have been given as 3.142, okay? Then the radius will be half of the diameter, so we have 0 0.08 over 2 raised to power 2. Over 2 because radius is half of diameter, that's why I have 0 0.08 over 2. So we can evaluate this. Let me just use my calculator. Say 3.142 times 0 0.04 raised to power 2 because 0 0.08 over 2 is 0 0.04. So that is 5.0272. Exponent minus 3, 5.0272 times 10 raised to the power minus 3 meters square. That is the area, okay? Then what else are we giving? We are giving the magnetic field strength B was given to be 0 0.25 Tesla, and then we are giving the voltage to be 480 volts. What we are asked to find is the Angular speed W. W is what we have to find. So the question is what formula is relating the number of tons, the area, the magnetic field intensity, and the voltage in an electric generator? The formula is that the EMF is equal to the area multiplied by the number of tons, multiplied by the magnetic intensity, multiplied by the angular velocity, such that that angular velocity we are looking for will be the voltage divided by the area multiplied by the number of tons multiplied by b and if you are to substitute all the values that we have we will see that our w will be what is the voltage that is 480 okay divided by the area we just got to be 5.0272 exponent minus 3 okay multiplied by the number of tons that's 500 multiplied by the magnetic field intensity 0.25. So this is what we need to input into the calculator 480 over the initial answer that we got multiplied by 500 multiplied by 0.25. So I can just say this is 480 divided by, I want to put all the denominator in the bracket, okay? So I have the answer that I just got multiplied by 500 multiplied by 0.25. So I can close that bracket and find my answer. So this is 763.84 five 763.845 and the unit is radian per second so this is the value of the angular speed for this particular case scenario of the electric generator that we are looking at it is this formula that we know that will really help us to solve the question and without knowing the formula we will not be able to solve this okay in this question, we are asked to explain eddy current and state two practical uses of eddy current. So, eddy current is a current that is induced and flowing within a metal block when there is a change in magnetic flux linking the block. Or we can say it is the loop of electric current that is induced within a conductor by reason of the changing magnetic flux of feed in the conductor. If you look at the previous question we are looking at, we are talking about an EMF being induced as a reason of an electric current in another coil. But here, in that case, we are talking about motion inductance. But here, in eddy current, eddy current is actually induced as a reason of a change in the magnetic flux that is linking the particular block. And this, so here is a picture that is showing us a coil that is having some electromagnetic feed. And as a result of that electromagnetic feed, eddy current is being generated from that coil. The other case, we are looking at motion inductance in which we have a particular current flowing in a coil and it's inducing EMF in the other coil. But here, we have a coil that is having an electromagnetic field that is inducing, that is generating 
current in another coil so this is just the definition and it can be used in induction furnaces induction coils speedometers and induction motors here we are being requested to define the critical angle as using optics and then to state two conditions necessary for total internal reflection to occur and finally we are to list three practical applications of total internal reflection so let's just look at a typical diagram of what is being requested of us in this particular case okay so here for us to define the critical angle we need to consider two media in which light rays is traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium so the one being shaded in this light blue is a denser medium that means that in this medium light rays will not travel as fast as in the other medium it will be faster in this white region than in this denser medium denser meaning that it is more compact it's more partly packed together so that it will resist the flow of light rays but even though it's resisting it means that light ray can still pass through but it will pass through faster in the other medium so if you are looking at that we can look at the incident ray of light coming into that medium and at the point of meeting the interface between the denser medium and the less dense medium the light ray is going to be refracted so in this particular case what we notice is that the incident ray is at an angle that is less than the critical angle because if it is getting to the critical angle in this particular second case scenario b okay let's call this a b and we'll call this c okay so if the incident ray the angle of incidence is not getting to be equal to the critical angle then the refracted ray will be at a right angle to the plane okay to the plane where we are taking the angle that's why you have this as theta to be 90 degrees so at that particular point we are having the critical angle that the angle that the incident ray makes with the normal is actually what is tagged the critical angle and what we notice is that after that critical angle okay you can see here is a critical angle but immediately after that critical angle we are going to see that light rays will not be refracted into the less dense medium it will just reflect back into the denser medium so in the first case Snell's law of refraction is being obeyed so in this second case we are going to have by the Snell's law n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2 but here theta 2 is 90 degrees and sine 90 is 1 okay so that n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 and that's why we now got that sine theta which is the incident angle is going to be n2 the refractive index in the less dense medium over the refractive index in the denser medium it is from this explanation that we are going to get this particular formula okay and then in the last case if you are looking at a case in which total internal reflection is occur means that the reflection is occurring inside the denser medium you can see we are not having refracted ray go out to the less dense medium we are not having the critical angle in which it is normal to the plane here we are seeing that it is totally reflected internally to the denser medium and that is the case in which we have the total internal reflection you can just use this as a guide to understand if you want to put those in words we will have it that in the first case the critical angle is the angle of incidence in the optically denser medium okay the more packed medium for which the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is 90 degrees okay and the condition that is necessary for that to take place is that first light rays must travel from a dense medium to a less dense medium so we are coming from a medium in which it is difficult for light rays to traverse as compared to the other medium then angle of incidence in the dense medium must be greater than the critical angle as explained in the other case then this total internal reflection finds practical applications in prism periscopes and binoculars in fiber optics cable in which you don't want the light rays to bounce into the cladding of your fiber optic material you want it to just bounce back inside the fiber optic material so that it can travel for a far distance okay we also can find this application in the transmission of radio signals and then we can also find this application with the view of the fish eye you can see that normally the fish is operating in a pool of water which is denser medium as compared to the atmospheric outside which is here which is less dense medium so how will the fish be able to actually see correctly the shapes that are outside the water body it's making use of total internal reflection in its biological modulus of randy okay so that is that about this question
we have to state two effects of refraction in this particular question but we need to know what refraction itself refraction is the bending of light as it travels from one transparent medium to another and by that definition we can see its effect in mirages in apparent displacement of object placed in a liquid medium and in the dispersion of white light for example in the rainbow a picture is going to convince you now sometimes you get to put like like in this particular case you get to place object in water and you see that originally the object is supposed to be coming straight but refraction will cause it to actually look as if it is distorted okay it's the same effect by which we actually see rays of light which is normally white being dispersed in the rainbow and of course in mirages in which we see objects in the wrong position as if the eye is playing a trick on us all this actually the effect of refraction all right in this question we're asked to define progressive waves and this is the definition that a progressive wave is a disturbance which travels through a medium that enables energy to be transferred from its source to another source without the transfer of the particles of the medium transfer so what you need to note is that in progressive waves there's a transfer of energy even though the particle that is transferring the energy itself is not being transferred it is stationary it is maintaining its position but yet it is transferring energy from one point to another there is a pictorial view of how a progressive will generally look now there is a general formula for the progressive way that is defined as y is equal to the amplitude a sine omega t minus 2 pi over lambda multiplied by x okay now if you need to note further the omega is actually 2 pi f and f itself is 1 over period so this is the same as 2 pi over the period so these are actually general equations that we can know so instead of writing um, omega t you can actually write um, 2 pi ft okay but in the next question we are going to see how we practically apply this equation of a progressive wave so yeah in this question we are told that a plane progressive wave is represented by the equation y is equal to 0 0.5 sine 1000 pi t minus 100 pi over 17x where y is in millimeters okay t is in seconds x is in meters and we are to calculate first the frequency of the wave the wavelength of the wave and the speed of the wave so this is what i would like us to do what we are giving is y is equal to 0 0.5 sine 1000 pi t minus 100 pi over 17 x okay now i want us to compare with the general formula that i just gave the other time that y is equal to a sine yeah i was saying that we can write wt or we can write 2 pi ft okay minus 2 pi over lambda x so these are two equations that we can compare already okay and some things are just coming out directly like for example comparing the two equations you can see that a is equivalent to 0 0.5 so we can see that the amplitude a is equal to 0 0.5 by comparison okay then for us to get the frequency of the wave as it's being requested there you can see the question on how far we are to get the frequency of the wave you compare these two entities this 1000 pi t over 2 pi left t we will see that 1000 pi t is equal to 2 pi ft and if that is the case you can cut out pi you can also cut out t such that we have 2f is equal to 1000 and that will render the frequency f to be 1000 over 2 and that will be 500 hertz okay that's the frequency of the wave then to get the wavelength okay what is the wavelength of the wave it is lambda okay and again by comparing we can see that this entity that is the coefficient of x and this entity that is the coefficient of x they are going to be the same so we can say 100 pi over 17 is equal to 2 pi over lambda okay again we can cut to say pi can cut here so that if you cross multiply we can have it that 100 lambda is equal to 2 times 17 so that lambda will be 2 times 17 over 100 and we need to look at that okay so we want to use our calculator 2 times 17 divided by 100 that is 
0.34 so the wavelength is 0.34 meters okay because already we are told that s is in meters then we have to find the speed of the wave so what is the formula for the speed of the wave the speed is given as v is equal to frequency times lambda so if you have missed the frequency and the lambda definitely you are going to miss the speed so here we can just see that our speed is 500 multiplied by 0.34 and if you bring in our calculator again so our previous answer 0.34 times 500 that's going to give us what that's 170 so this is going to be 170 meters per second so with this with the understanding of the fact that we know the general formula for the equation of a progressive wave we can compare each of the entities like the amplitude is 0 0.5 1000 pi t is 2 pi left t then 100 pi over 17 is 2 pi over lambda and we can get the frequency the wavelength and then we can get the speed to be 170 meters per second all right yeah we have this beautiful question from yek and it is looking exactly like an alternative to practicals but it's being featured in a theory paper so students you just need to prepare for whatsoever may be coming from your exam paper and that's why we're taking our time to walk you through this and you can find a whole lot of other examples by checking our videos and playlists so that you can best be prepared to gain that academic excellence in the exam so yeah we have been told that in an experiment to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization of water a student places a heater in a beaker containing water the beaker stands on an electronic balance so that the mass of the beaker and water could be measured so don't worry i'm going to show you this pictorially so that you understand what we are talking about so the heater is switched on and readings were taken every 100 seconds when the water starts boiling the table below shows the reading so we have the time in increment of 100 seconds okay we have the reading on the balance measured in gram 203 and co then we are to fill in the mass of the water evaporated here the mass of the water evaporated in grams then we are also to get the energy supplied by the by the eater measured in juice but before we go ahead to do that like i promised i want to show you what this is really looking like so here this is a typical example of what we are talking about here this is the eater that the student is using to heat up the water it is standing on a balance an electronic balance to take the measurement of the mass of water that have been evaporated okay so if the water is boiling of course some water molecules will be lost to the atmosphere so the remaining mass of the water will reduce so we can take that reading from the balance okay then this heater can be switched on you can switch it on here and of course it is getting its power from the socket here and the timing is 100 100 seconds intervals okay, so in 100 seconds intervals we are going to be taking those readings now this is what i want you to note what's going to be the means of getting the mass of water evaporated in 100 seconds intervals you can see that if you have an initial reading i think we're giving one let me confirm 203.22 and 201.62 so initially we have 203.22 and 201.62 afterwards okay so this is this is the initial measurement this is the second measurement between this particular two how do we get the mass of water that is evaporated you can see that this mass measured in grams here this year initially at the first instance it is greater so the amount that was lost is going to be the difference in the two grammage of the mass of water that is being measured so it's going to be 203.22 minus 201.62 so the mass will be the difference between these two so we have it as 203.22 minus 201.62 and if you just do that mathematics 2 minus 2 is 0 here we can borrow 1 12 minus 6 that is 6 and here we have 2 remaining 2 minus 1 so it is 1.6 grams that is the mass of water evaporated and just like this we also do for the subsequent ones okay another thing i want to point out from the look at this particular statement in 2 we are given that the eater supplies energy at the rate of this is what i need you student to notice at the rate of 30 joules per second then we're asked to fill in the values of the energy supplied by the heater in 100 seconds 200 seconds 300 seconds 400 seconds but it was originally giving is supplying energy at the rate of 
38 joules per second. And look at what we are being asked to find. We are to find the energy supplied by the ether, but the unit is in joules, joules, joules. These are small, small things that students can really help you to make the best of your exam. So, 38 joules per second, we have the energy, energy, the energy rate is 38 joules per second. Then we are giving time to be 100 seconds, then 200 seconds, and so on. How do we get the energy that is used up? It's going to be the multiplication of the rate of supply of the energy multiplied by the timing because look at this, this is joules per second. So if you multiply joules by seconds by second, you will see that the seconds will cancel and we have only the energy in joules remaining. So those are the understanding that will perfectly help you to just have a walkthrough in this exam and you have your full mark seamlessly. But without this understanding, you are not going to get the exam. But that is why you are here working through this together so that you can gain that understanding and you can use it to leverage on your exam and gain the academic essence. So, two things we have discovered. First, to get the mass of water evaporator, we need to subtract from the previous measurement that was taken and to get the energy that was used to evaporate that mass of water. We have to multiply the rate of energy supply with the time that we are looking at. So, we are going to go ahead and do that now. So, from our previous discussion, we cannot go ahead to compute the value of the mass of water that is evaporated, measured in grams. Okay, so here it's just going to be zero. That's the initial one. But for subsequent one, so in this particular case, we are going to have this 203.22, which is the initial mass, minus each of these subsequent entries that we have in the table. So it will be um, 203.22 minus 201.62. And that is 1.6 as we got initially. So this is 1.60 grams. Okay. Yeah, for the second one, it's going to be the same 203.22 minus now the new value that we have here. That's 199.79. So minus 199.79. That's going to give us what? 3.43 grams. So this is 3.43 grams. So this is 3.43 Three grams. In the third case, we also have 203.22 minus 198.26, 198.26. So that is 4.96. So this is 4.96. And then finally, we're also going to have 203.22 minus 196.50. Okay. So that is 6.72. 6.72 grams okay so that is for the mass of water evaporated now we can also move on to the energy supply by the heater initially there is no energy supply but once we begin to have some mass of water getting evaporated that is an indication that some amount of energy has been supplied and like i explained before it's going to be the energy rate multiplied by the time that we are using so in the first case there is going to be 30 joules per second multiplied by 100 and that is going to be 3,800 joules. Okay. In the second case, it's going to be 38 joules per second multiplied by 200 seconds. So I can have 38 times 200. So that's 7,600 joules. 7,600 joules. In the third case, it's going to be multiplied by 300. That's 11,400 joules. And finally, it's going to be multiplied by 400, and that's 15,200 joules. So this is 15,200 joules. So this is the table that we're going to use to plot the graph of energy supplied on the vertical axis, okay, and the mass of water evaporated on the horizontal axis, just like this. And then we can determine the slope of the graph and find what the value of the slope means. So that's what we're going to do right about now. So here yeah, we can have this as our table of values which we extracted from the bigger table that we got the values from initially and then we have our graph. Now this is a modified scaled graph, okay? Your graph will be like twice the scaling for this one but this is just representative and I believe that you as a student out there, if you can understand it from here, you should be able to transfer it to your graph as appropriate. So we are going to have our vertical as this. So we have our vertical as this. I also have our horizontal as is just as is shown here. Now we are particularly told that we should start from the origin. So this have to be the origin. 
okay and for this particular set of values that i have to get to fit into the graph i have to use the scale of four four units okay so from here to here i will say this is four this is eight this is twelve and this is sixteen okay so this is the axis for the energy in joules okay and here on the horizontal axis i can just use a scale of i have zero to six point seven two so i can say I have 0 to 7, so I can just scale like this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so in that case, I can take it to be 2, 4, 6, and 8, and this is the mass in grams. Okay, so yeah, it's good to always tie to your graph. So I can say this is graph of the mass in grams versus the energy in joules okay so we can now go ahead to compute the corresponding values for this you can also note your scale yeah i could have said okay two centimeter represent four unit okay because it's a modified scale i just want you to note so that i said okay from here to here is two centimeters so that is representing four units but this is just a modified graph okay so let's be on the same page with respect to that so here yeah, when m is zero E is zero, so both of them are starting from the origin. So you have both of them starting from the origin here. Now, when M is 1.6, E is 3800. Now, here on my graph, this is how you can actually go about to get your scale correctly. I have 10 divisions between zero and two, so I can say that 10 division is corresponding to two. So, what is one division corresponding to one division? What is it going to give me? I can just cross multiply. To say the value of one division is going to be 1 times 2 is 2 over 10 and 2 over 10 is 0 0.2 okay so each of these small division is 0 0.4 like here is 0 0.2 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.8 1 okay 1 1.2 1.4 1.6 1 1.8 and 2 you can see there's that consistency because i've been able to get the base value of each of the small units okay and the same thing here, I can say 10 divisions corresponds to 4 on the vertical axis. Then I can say what is one division going to correspond to. I can also cross multiply to get that division to be 4 over 10, which is 0 0.4. So each one here is 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.2, 1.6, 2.0, 2.4, 2 2.8, 3.2, 3.6 and 4 okay incremental value of 0 0.4 so once i know that i can actually compute all of the values that i have on the table of values correctly and extrapolate as appropriate so in the first case when m is 1.6 you can say i know this is one okay so here this will be 1.2 1.4 1.6 so this is 1.6 and for e it will be 3800 so i know this is 2 2.4 here 2.8 3.2 3.6 and between 3.6 and 4 this year is going to be 3.8 okay so i can just say this is now 3.8 and i'm going to look for the point of intersection of the two so i just want to trace that out just very faintly for you students out there to see so i have something like this and something like this and the point of intersection is my point of interest that i can just denote as what i'm looking for okay now when m is 3.43 yeah i know this is 3 then after that 3 i can say i have 3.2 3.4 and 3.6 so 3.43 will be close to 3.4 okay and then that'll be like here and then 7600 so in between 4 and 8 is 6 so this is 6 6.4 6.8 7.2 and 7.6 so there again you can just look at this to be 7.6 and here 3.43 and i can just denote that as appropriate 
Now, students, let me just give you some very, very important hints. Now, this is going to be a straight line graph, okay? Because you can see already, it's like it's going to be consistent. As a rule of thumb, if you just want to act into what you are doing, this is what I could as well just ask you to do that. You just draw a straight line from the origin and pass through what you already have as your line of best fit so that you can fit in all other values as appropriate. So something like this should be good for your graph and then I will go ahead and just extrapolate the other values. Like for example, when I have 4.96, yeah, we have 4.96 will be close to 5. So I can just say I count to trace from here. So I can just trace this up and then the value for the energy is 11,400. This is 8, this is 10, 10.4, 10.8, 11.2, okay, so 11.4 will just be around there, and you can see how that is just consistent, and you'll be able to just scale to get your full mark and your line of back width, okay? So, the other one, we have 6.72 and 15,200, so yeah, 6, 6.2, 6.4, 6.6. 6.8, so it's around there, 6.72, and then 15.2, will just be somewhere around there too, okay, so that's just a reverse way for you to quickly also extrapolate your values and you get your line of best fits, all right, so furthermore, we have to calculate the slope of the graph, okay, the slope of the graph that's going to be if I call it M that's going to be the change in the vertical axis that's changing energy in joules over the change in the horizontal axis that's changing mass in grams okay so we need to evaluate two points so I want I just want to highlight my two points so on the graph you want to take two points I think I love this is directly on 12 then I can also take this which is directly on four okay so i can just take out those points to say i have this coming here and i have this going here so that i can get the change in the vertical as the change in energy is here the first one is 12 minus the second one is four and then the change in the mass this is four this is five this is 5.2 5.4 we have 5.4 minus here we have it at just before 2 that will be 1.8 1.8 okay so the slope is going to be 12 minus 4 divided by 5.4 minus 1.8 and the unit you don't forget that is joules over gram okay so you want to get that m 12 minus 4 is 8 that's 8 joules over 5.4 minus 1.8, 14 minus 8 is 6, so I've borrowed one here, meaning for 4 minus 1, that is 3, 3.6 grams. So, if we put, oh, oh, this is becoming quite interesting. You cannot leave your unit in grams, so you need to convert to kilogram to say that is 3.6 times 10 raised to power minus 3 kilograms. Okay, so that's, that's quite an interesting one. If you leave it in grams, the definition of your slope will not be correct. You need to convert from grammage to kilogram. And to do that, you divide by 1000, which is the same as multiplying by exponent minus 3. Okay? So if you want to just use a calculator to do that, you can say 8 divided by 3.6 exponent minus 3. Okay? Let me put that in bracket to ensure that I'm doing the right thing. Okay? Alright, so that is 2222.2, that's 2222.2 joules per kilogram. Alternatively, you can say this is 2.22 times 10 raised to power 3 joules per kilogram. So, that is the slope of the graph. And finally, now we are finally asked what is the meaning of that slope. Look at this graph. We are taking the energy against the mass in grams. So, this particular slope is meaning that 
it is the amount of heat that is needed to evaporate needed to evaporate one gram of water so it's the amount of it needed to evaporate one gram of water at constant temperature you know is at the boiling point that the evaporation is taking place so it is at constant temperature so that is the solution to this question that was created to look like alternatives of practical but we've been able to demystify it and look at it holistically to answer the questions and plot the graph and interpret the slope of the graph as appropriate all right in this question we're asked to explain what is meant by saturated vapor pressure and to state the factor that affects the saturated vapor pressure so if we look at a system like this in which we are increasing the temperature of a body system if it is not closed normally evaporation occurs and molecules of the liquid will escape however in a closed system all we notice is that the molecules that will gain energy will normally tend to get evaporated from the liquid and they will also get to exact pressure on the particular system so that at the point the molecules that are evaporated will reach equilibrium with the liquid surface that the rate at which molecules are being evaporated and the rate at which they are actually coming back to the liquid they will be the same okay and at that point the system is said to have reached saturation so if you want to explain the saturated vapor pressure we can say that at any given temperature some energy molecules of a liquid in a given system escape from the liquid surface as vapor and at the same time they also return to the liquid so vapor pressure is built up above the liquid in the process and when the rate of escape equals the rate of return the vapor is said to be saturated and the pressure it is at is called the saturated vapor pressure at that particular temperature the factor that affects the saturated vapor pressure is temperature so that is all there is about that question on saturated vapor pressure all right in this question we are asked to define isotopes now isotopes are atoms of the same elements that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons so that will warrant that such atoms they have the same atomic number but different mass number and the classical example is carbon 12 carbon 13 and carbon 14 which all happens to be isotopes of carbon okay so you can see in the first case carbon 12 has six protons and six neutrons in the second case carbon 13 has six protons and seven neutrons in its core okay and then carbon 14 has six protons and eight neutrons as shown in the diagram so these are isotopes of carbon and that is the definition for isotopes here in this question we are being mandated to mention two uses of radioactive tracers in each of the following areas so in medicine in industry and in the agriculture we are to mention two uses of radioactive tracers and here yeah, they are listed here in medicine the radioactive tracers are used to monitor the function of thyroid glands they can be used to detect blood clots in the brain and they are used to sterilize medical equipment in the industry the radioactive tracers are used to detect leakages in underground pipes they can be used to detect wear and tear of moving parts of machinery and they can be used to detect traces of pollution in the environment and in agriculture radioactive tracers can be used to determine the absorption of mineral elements by plants it can be used to study the mechanism of photosynthesis it can be used to preserve seedlings and other food items and it's also used in the sterilization of insects in this question we are told that when light of frequency 5.4 times 10 to the power 14 hertz is incident on a metal surface the maximum energy of the emitted electrons is 1.2 exponent minus 19 joules now we are asked to calculate the minimum frequency of radiation for which electrons can be emitted and we are given the Planck's constant h to be 6.6 times 10 to the power minus 4 joule seconds so here is the pictorial view of the scenario that is being given to us in this particular case in which we have this light of photon energy hf okay in yellow that is incident on this metal surface okay and then the maximum energy of the emitted electrons this kinetic energy is the energy with which the electrons will be emitted was given as 1.2 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules we are now asked to calculate the minimum frequency of radiation for which the electrons can be emitted now this is what is happening in the emission of electrons from the metal surface the photon of energy that is coming from the light source is actually the sum of the work function of the metal plus the kinetic energy with which 
electrons will be emitted okay the work function itself is giving us the Planck's constant multiplied by the threshold frequency okay so we can express this as hf no plus the kinetic energy since we are giving the kinetic energy directly we can just use that now what we are asked to find is this minimum frequency okay that is the threshold for which electrons can be emitted and looking at the information that we have been given already we have the Planck's constant okay we have been given the frequency of the light rays that is coming onto the metal surface and then we are looking for the minimum frequency of radiation we have the kinetic energy also we have the Planck's constant so it's just a matter of rearranging this equation to effectively solve for the f norm that we are looking for okay so rearranging this we just have hf norm is equal to hf minus the kinetic energy when this kinetic energy moves to the left hand side such that the minimum frequency of radiation we are looking for is going to be 1 over h multiplied by hf minus the kinetic energy so if you want to express that we'll see that the minimum frequency of radiation is going to be what is the plus constant that is 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 let me just express this as 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 34 hf will be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 34 times the frequency of the incident rays okay that is 5.4 times 10 to the power 14 okay minus the kinetic energy that was given was 1.2 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules so this is what we need to express on our calculator to find the minimum frequency of radiation for which electrons can be emitted so we just need to bring in our calculator now so i just want to put everything directly so i'm going to have a bigger bracket taking care of the numerator before i now insert the denominator so i have double bracket here okay the second bracket for this particular expression 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 okay times 5.4 exponent 14 so i'm closing this particular bracket then minus 1.2 exponent minus 19 so i'm closing the bracket for the numerator now then divided by this denominator 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 okay so i just need to check hope there is no mistake anywhere and if I'm convinced that there is none, I can just press the equal to sign. So this will be 3.582 exponent 14. So this is 3.582 exponent 14 at frequency is measured in at. So that is the minimum frequency of radiation for which electrons can be emitted from this particular metal surface. Here yeah, we are asked to state three features that are common to electromagnetic waves. So this is a pictorial view of the electromagnetic waves with its wavelength, the direction of propagation, magnetic field in this particular vertical axis, and the electric field in the horizontal axis. And the features that are common to them as listed here. It is that one, they travel with the speed of light in vacuum. Okay, they can be propagated through vacuum medium, which is an addendum coming from the first point. Then they undergo reflection, refraction, diffraction, polarization, and also interference. And interestingly, they are also transverse waves. So these are some features that are common to electromagnetic waves. In this question, we also mention four components of the nuclear reactor, and then we have to state the function of the components that we mention. Okay, so you need to be careful here that you just don't mention some component that you'll not be able to state their function. So make sure that the component you want to mention, you can state what they do in the nuclear reactor. So this is a typical feature of the nuclear reactor in which some of the components that we have there include the uranium fuel, the graphite moderator, control rod that is made of boron, the coolant, the heat exchanger, and the sheet, okay? And we want to look at the functions of these components. We are going to see it now. So yeah, these are the components listed for us to see. The uranium rod serves as a fuel in the nuclear reactor, whereas the graphite moderator controls the speed of the neutron. The control rod made of boron is used to control the population of the neutron in the system, then the coolant reduces the SS heat. Look at that, the word coolant. It reduces heat that is produced in the reaction. The heat exchanger is the one that converts the produced heat energy to other forms of energy to be used at the consumption level. And then the sheet protects against extraneous radiation, which is not good for the health. And that is all about this question. And so with that, we've come to the end of this beautiful set of questions 
looking at the white 2020 school candidate exam for physics theory paper and it had been a wonderful journey we've looked at so so many things i will believe that all these efforts will help you to gain that academic excellence now we want to just implore you if you watch up to this level then definitely you are finding this video useful why not go ahead and click that like button so that we'll get to know that yes all we are putting out there is finding relevance in the life of somebody and that's why the person is giving us the feedback that he or she likes the video and then share with your friends you don't need to add this to yourself it takes a whole lot of effort to put this together and we want it to reach as far and as wide as possible so let's just make this excellence the common thing for all of us so that we can attain a better future that we are aiming for and then don't forget to click the subscription icon so that once we upload our videos you get instant notification and get to know about them it's been a wonderful journey i really appreciate you for staying up to this point it's dave to academy and until next time god bless you